Hello, everybody. Welcome to your very favorite Bronze Age Spider-Man podcast. Here comes the Spider-Cast. I am your co-host, Michael, and as always, I'm joined by... Joshua Mervell, and today we're going to be looking at Spider-Man comics from July of 1993. Sorry, that's 83. Right. Is, I said 93. That's, <laughs> that's okay. We, we, we threw off our listeners for a brief moment there, but we're yeah. back on track. So, <laughs> so um, this week is very special because... We have a special guest this week, Kristen. Say hello, Kristen. Hello, everybody. And uh, we know each other through the local uh, TV cable station, TV Kojiko. I believe that's how we met, right? Yes, we met. We met at the Kojiko. Yeah, the, yes, yes. <laughs> that romantic and, I mean, tale. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So for those that don't know, the Comic Book Syndicate uh, video web series thingy is on TV Kojiko in Windsor, Ontario. And Kristen, you've hosted your own show on there as well, correct? Yes, I hosted a, an arts show on there for three or four seasons called Behind the Scenes. So I was uh, uh, interviewing members of the arts community. That was my gig for a little while. That's so cool. I imagine it was fun, right? It was awesome. It was awesome. It introduced me to so many cool people within the arts community, and uh, it gave me a chance to talk about making art, which is I, it's one of my favorite things in my, my regular day-to-day -day life. I'm a theater maker, and I, mm -hmm. uh, I run a box office and a theater at, at our university, and yeah, I, I, um, I love being a part of the arts community for sure. But comics is an area that I have not delved into in terms of art and creation. I, I have never been a comic book reader or any of that. So this is all new to me. Well, you know, um, we're glad to have you along then because, um, you know, I, I, I have no segue. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really great to have like a, a fresh perspective because Spider-Man yes. is probably a, a character that you are familiar with just through uh, like yeah. pop culture osmosis. Uh, so it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see your perspective as an artist reading comic books, especially Spider-Man comics for the first time. So this is going to be really fun, I think. For sure. That's right. Mm. Yes, and as we were talking about before we started recording, you recently did a Marvel marathon. You watched all 23 movies in three weeks. Yes, yes. For, it was a big task. for the task. first time. Yeah. I, well, and you, I, as I told you when we first started, I, I had been, I felt like I was like wandering in the wilderness and I had not ever <laughs> stumbled upon any aspect of the Marvel comic universe. Like wow. when people mm -hmm. would talk about these, these characters, like these superheroes and, and yes, like I knew the base, like I knew Batman, Superman and Spider-Man. I didn't know the difference between Marvel and DC. I didn't know anything about any other superheroes really besides those big three. And uh, and so this was a huge education piece for me. And somehow, like, I just, I don't know, it never really crossed paths. Like, it was never, I never saw any of the movies. I, I never, like, I had a friend drag me to one of the movies or something. So sure. this was, like, learning about the whole Marvel Universe from start to finish and going through the Infinity Saga. It was, by the end of it, I felt like a, like a huge comic book fan because I knew these characters so well and I knew, you know, which stories were told really well, which which ones were more convoluted and and we did a whole web series as a family where we um it, me, myself and my husband and my four kids watched all these movies and then gave the, these little video reviews at the end some of them were we were absolutely baffled you know and, and some of mm -hmm. them were we were thrilled we were like cheering at the end so it it was a really cool series to do and you know something to focus on in a time of corona <laughs> that's really awesome absolutely Yes, uh, we've definitely, I think, upped our frequency a little bit through coronavirus with podcasts and video reviews and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, But one of the things I want to ask you about is that now that you've seen all the Spider-Man movies, including the ones from Marvel, you've seen the Andrew Garfield ones, right? Uh, those are the, the 90s that's ones? The, <laughs> or no, the no, that's the... In, in, so it was Tobey Maguire for three movies, then Andrew Garfield for two and now it's been Tom Holland for two. Oh, no, I missed the Andrew Garfield ones. Okay. okay, so between yeah, between Tobey Maguire and Tom Holland, which one do you like which series do you like better? I, you know, at first I didn't like the Tom Holland ones. The uh, so we we watched um Homecoming and mm. I thought it was stupid. I was really annoyed. <laughs> and and well, and the fact what's the first one that he shows up in? Uh, Civil he shows War. up in Civil War. Yeah, yeah, he shows up in Civil War, which is like halfway through the saga. And I was like, who 
is this kid and why did they wreck the Spider-Man story? Like I, it wasn't like, like I, it wasn't like I, I looked at the Tobey Maguire one that I knew from my past and I was like, that is the gospel. Like I never mm. thought that, that he was like a perfect Spider-Man and he was infallible or anything. I, but I kind of, like I knew a little bit of the 60s cartoon and I thought, I have an idea of who Spider-Man is. I, I've seen like, Whatever, like at the time of the Tobey Maguire movies, there was all kinds of Spider-Man spinoff stuff. So like, I'm sure we had a couple of Spider-Man books kicking around and stuff like that. And I feel like mm-hmm. I knew some of his villains and some of his, you know, I knew Daily Bugle and J. Jonah Jameson. And there was none of that in this in this part right. of, you know, introducing the Tom Holland Spider-Man. And I was offended. Like, I hated it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like you couldn't, you couldn't make me like Ned, like Ned was really likable, but like, ah, I don't care. And, <laughs> and then, um, and then we right. watched, uh, we watched Far From Home and it was sort of like Euro trip Spider-Man. Um, mm. which again, I was like, I don't know, I, I guess he kind of grew on me a little bit by the end of that movie, but it still wasn't like going back to the comics that we're looking at tonight, like. I I prefer the classic Spider-Man look. I'm like, give me the guy that's like a photographer for the, for the Daily Bugle. Like, that's right. the guy that I know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. there, there, there's a possible explanation for that. And this is only according to Midnight's Edge. That's a, like a YouTube series. I don't know if this is true or not. But apparently, because Sony owns the film rights to Spider-Man, the only way that they would let Marvel do these movies is to make it so different from the Marvel version of spider-man that it wouldn't be it's it's like i think there's some kind of contract thing where it has to be quote 25 percent different whatever that means wow. so that's why they made aunt may young that's why they changed um ned leeds uh, uh, that's why they changed and mj yeah and, and mj like yeah she's not mj she's not mary jane she's oh she's something michelle like or michelle, something, something yeah michelle yeah. yeah so there is an explanation however I can forgive a lot, but I think the thing that bothers me the most is that that frickin' Tony Stark tech costume. Yeah. That, to me, that it's not Spider-Man. If he has all these extra pa- abilities that come from his suit, to me, it's no longer Spider-Man. Yeah, right? that's like that's but, Batman, guys. Like that. Right. That's a totally different thing. That doesn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, 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 I agree with the suit. All that stuff was cool, but mm-hmm. I agree with the suit. What I do love about. Uh, uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man is that he's a kid because when he first started right. out like Spider-Man was in high school he wasn't a college kid and this really feels like a teenager rather than uh, right. Tobey Maguire which even even in the first Spider-Man movie Tobey Maguire I never believed once that he was a high school kid Right. you know what I mean so I, I, you know, I do like that yeah. side of it um, and it does yeah. feel more like I, I think Peter Parker might be a little bit closer um, with Tom Holland from when uh, he's first started out and Tobey Maguire feels more of like maybe of what we're reading now in the comics where he's more sure. in college and a little bit more adult. Yeah, that could be true. Mm-hmm. That could be true. Okay, so on that note, we are going to dive into these comics. Yeah. So so just for the record, this is these, these comics from 1983 and this is around the time I would have been, oh boy, seven years old. And at this point, I had maybe two or three Spider-Man comics, so this is a little bit before I started reading as a regular reader. But um, I went back. I'm, this is more for you, Kristen, just so you kind of know. But I went back and collected these when I was older because this was what I considered to be the peak period of Spider-Man, and that's kind of why we're doing those, this podcast to focus on this era, the 1980s. And so we're going to start off this week with Amazing Spider-Man 242. Featuring the Mad Thinker and his awesome android. Now, before we dive into this, Kristen, have you ever heard of these characters, these uh, villains before? No. So I didn't know about the Thinker. In in some of the other ones that we'll do tonight, I knew a couple of them, but I did not know the Thinker. Um, okay. But I really liked him as a villain. Holy cow! And I have. Me too. I yeah. liked this one. This one was my fave of the ones that we read. Like I. Me too. I I love this one. I thought like okay, we'll talk about it a little bit more. I think, but yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we will. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just yeah, I'm just gonna summarize it quickly, and then we'll we'll definitely we'll let you have the first uh, review here. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, we start off with Peter Parker in the classic '80s Spider-Man mode. You know, he's going, he's hanging out at the university, which is where we like him to be. He's he's you know reminiscing about some of the things that have been going on about how. Uh, you know, he's gotten into trouble with his grades and 
His girlfriend was shot and in the hospital, blah, 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 blah. So he's got to deal with that for a little bit. But we love that we, stuff, right? We also and get this... even one more one more little jab in at Deb, Deb Whitman. I know. Oh, he's still, my God. So, so he asks, you know he asks about Deb Whitman and then says, ah, forget it. I don't have time for this. And walks away. Are you kidding? I know. So this is this is... Uh. This is the perhaps, hopefully, the only time in Peter Parker's career where he's been psychologically abusive to one of his girlfriends. And yeah. me and Josh survived the two or three year storyline of him treating this woman like complete crap. And then she basically went insane and then left the comic and didn't come back until like the 2000s. Right. But in, in this story, yes, we get oh. one final passing reference to her. And what does he say here? Um, oh, have you heard anything from Deb? She has some mighty big problems to solve. <laughs> oh, when no. I saw her last. Those mighty uh, big problems, by the way, is uh, schizophrenia. Yeah, the, the, oh writers, the, writers, <laughs> the, writers, the writers wrote her so inconsistently and... They made Peter treat her so bad, they decided the only way we can write this character out is to give her schizophrenia and then ride off in a bus to go back oh to God, her that hometown. Poor, <laughs> that poor, <sighs> poor girl. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, what, what makes it even better is then the, the, the professor's like, she seems to be doing well, but she still has a lot of weight, a lot weighing on her mind. Peter. Don't we all? I'll be checking back, Dr. Sloan. Happy grading. Well, that was futile. Looks like the, the only news I'll get today is what I'll find in the Daily Bugle. That's it. That's the last time right. Peter Parker gives any thought to his girlfriend of three years. Well, and it's, it's <laughs> a passing. It's like, it's like oh, God, we got to talk about this girl. Can, can I just get my grades, please? Like, can we he's, just talk about my grades? He's literally and back to me. He's literally walking in the other direction while he's explaining what's going on with them. <laughs> Like he, yep. he's, he, there's not a moment where he's actually looking at him while they're right. talking about Deb. Yep. He's just gone. He's waving his hand dismissively, and he's out of there. Yep. <sighs> you might as well be doing that motion with your hand when you like uh, pretend you're talking, like the Pac-Man. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. It might as well be a Peter Parker shaped cloud there, because he just runs off. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my um, goodness. So, so anyway, so then we yeah we touch base with uh, Lance Bannon, who's kind of been Peter Parker's rival for a few years. But now what's happened is, is he's dating a girl who's been hitting on Peter, and we're gonna we're gonna get back to that in a minute. But before we go there, we touch base with the Mad Thinker, who is so cool that he's actually figured out a way to project his mind into his secret headquarters, where he's got a couple of his uh, awesome androids stashed, and he electronically telepathically orders them to uh you know whatever go on to this mission that he has in mind so basically we find out that peter and uh so sorry lance bannon's girlfriend and her and him have an open relationship but now he's jealous because it, her name her name is amy by the way because now she's going after peter and he's trying to convince peter that it's actually all just manipulation and blah 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 so he's got to deal with that but but before he can deal with that he has a confrontation with the Mad Thinker's awesome android who attacks him while he's swinging through the city. So then, of course, it's a superhero comic, so we got to have a few pages of fight scenes here. But it's actually pretty cool, as usual, because it's Roger Stern and John Romita Jr. So Yeah, can I yeah, ask? Get... The, I felt like these fight scenes were drawn so differently. Like, that, there's so much action here. Like, the angles of, of the way that these mm. are drawn, I thought, were was really striking. Like, it just... I loved the, this part of it. Like, I thought it was a cool fight scene to, to put in here. Is that, like, a different artist or something? Maybe we talk about that later. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, do you mean different from the other ones we read this week? or? Well, I don't know. Different... Well, like I say, I mean, I, I don't read a ton of comics or anything. Mm -hmm. But, like, the one right. where, where he's, like, flipping backwards and then shoots off of the side right. of the... the Fantastic. Uh, like, they're yeah. so... And, 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 you know, he falls... The way that you can see him falling, I don't know, I just thought like, the angles were really cool. The way that they, they mm -hmm. drew all of this was very cool. Yes. John Romita, well, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go I ahead, was going to say, John Romita Jr. is very, at least to me, he's very infamous for uh, having really great like screen direction and layout of his mm -hmm. panels. Uh, you can really follow what's happening in the action where a lot of other artists, when they need Spider-Man to punch, we see him jump and punch a guy. It's not, we don't, we don't really physically what is like, see what's happening in space, but I just feel like he is very good at describing what's happening through action lines mm -hmm. and through poses and setting up uh, uh, like establishing shots early on. And right. he's also really good at um, sh only showing you what you need to see. So if it's right. not important, it's usually a plain background. 
because you you already understand what's happening and then you're just focusing on on the actual action that he doesn't like muddy everything up with like a busy background. Mm-hmm. He really is great at focusing on what's important to tell the story. Um, and I, I, it is also um, probably important to note too, that we're reading digital versions of these comics and mm-hmm. the amazing Spider-Man is the only one that has been updated. And uh, right. uh, the other two were digital, like they're just like scans like photocopies from the actual comic. So the the line work and like the coloring might be a little bit crisper and cleaner for this one, but that's only because this is like a digital version that's been touched up. Right, right, right. But but yeah. but I yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not disagreeing with you with the art. It's it's very good in this in this issue. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing is like a, a lot of people complained about his art at the time, but I, I think that there's like a classic Marvel you know traditional style, and he is definitely one of the masters. Mm-hmm. He's a master of action, and he's a master of storytelling, and I think it shows here, just like just like you, you guys both said. Mm-hmm. So then we touch base with a quick subplot of a certain redhead coming to Peter Parker's apartment um, to inquire his whereabouts. Uh, Kristen, did you have any guess of who this was at this point in the story? Okay, so I had no idea mm-hmm. what the, what was going on here. I wasn't sure. I mean, I I knew that Amy was blonde from the other uh, panels that we had seen before. I didn't know for sure that this was Mary Jane. I knew that she was a redhead also. I don't... Mm -hmm. uh, But then, uh, like, the only other redhead that we saw, honestly, when I first flipped through, I was like, oh, it's Bannon. (laughs) Because they had the same hair. And then I had to go back, and it's like this trench-coated figure. Like, And then I was like, oh, no, that's a lady. What is going on here? There's, like, a lady with Lance Bannon's hair. This is confusing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Um, It's actually funny, because one of the reasons I, I wanted to make sure I got you in on this issue is because... I th- I remember you saying in one of your reviews of the movies that you felt like um, the new Spider-Man movies were not really Spider-Man because it wasn't really Mary Jane, right? Well, it's not. I mean, I I don't know. It's sort of like like when you look at if I can accept that the new Spider-Man is a completely different story, but there's mm-hmm. like certain things that you have to preserve about who like there's she has signature red hair. She is a person right. like you you know who she is. Her character is really established. So to just make her into somebody different, I had to like mourn the loss of that, I think. Sure, sure. And I think this is really iconic. Like you know you know exactly who who she is. You know, mm-hmm. she has she has an iconic look for sure. So And also the would you have thought going back to so this is eighty three, because me and Josh have been reviewing three years worth of Spider-Man comics, and she's been almost nowhere to be seen. I think. Does that surprise you? Yeah, I think. Yeah, it, it does to me. I think. Like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm like the boring basics, but I feel like I haven't really delved into these comics very much. Mm-hmm. I think once, once you get through like the basic storyline, then you can start to diversify it with new characters and change things up. But I, I just didn't know that that's what happened in these comics. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're going to say Josh? I, I was just going to say, I think this is only the second time we've actually seen her. Um, I right. think that she might have been like briefly mentioned, like MJ talking about uh, Mrs. Watson's niece. But other than that, um, right. yeah, this might be the first time she's actually like been in the On same panel. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and, and also in the, in the three years we've covered, Peter Parker has not only dated Deborah Whitman, he's also been in love with the black cat right uh he had another date with another girl and now he's kind of i think he's kissed amy powell and he might have had sex with someone else i think yeah that that I don't one remember, girl he anyway. was studying with right right that's the one so yeah he's just swinging he's swinging single here but anyway holy cow so, mm-hmm. spider-man yes. gets around i had no yeah. idea yeah yeah i was like at this age i was watch. i was reading like archie comics and there's like occasionally a new character in there, but it's a pretty solid love triangle. They don't add new people. Right. Like the, the idea that comic characters can date people who are not their appointed person is like mm. mind blowing to me. Like I'm so square with this stuff. <laughs> I hear you though. I hear you. So anyway, so then Peter Parker comes up with a really cool idea and that's that um, he's going to trick this Android into pushing through his near unbreakable web and, uh, kind of um, pulling this gigantic thingamabob on top of it, on top of it to basically destroy him, and so that's how he ends up defeating the android. And really, we, we should also point out, but that the motivation behind the, the Mad Thinker's plot was to sort of study Spider-Man's um, 
theoretical spider sense because no one really knows about spider-man's spider sense but mad thinker has heard rumors about it and so this is his way of trying to prove it right so basically once that fight is over peter brecker goes back home and he was supposed to have a i think it was like a dinner date with amy powell but she ends up showing up at his apartment and she's got a picnic basket ready she's all ready to go right. and then right away they start making out and then Peter, with lipstick all over his face, hears a knock at the door. He turns around, and who's at the door but Mary Jane Watson. And she's like, uh, I'm Mary Jane Watson. Have I let myself in at the wrong time, Petey? To be continued. Dun, there dun, we go. Dun. Yep. So, Amazing Spider-Man 242. So, Kristen, what's your first impression? I I liked it. I mean, I think I think there's... Uh, this this was the first one that I read too, so I thought that it was like I'm like this is the Spider Man, this is the one I'm talking about, you know? Right. So, but right. I, I like I say, I mean, I really liked a lot of the the um, the the way that that uh, the fight scene was laid out was really big for me. The the way that the characters were introduced, everything was really clear. I liked the villain of the Thinker. I thought that he was really cool, and and a lot of like. The way that his abilities are are like the way that the room dissolves around him, you know. I I, mm-hmm. I really thought it was captivating. I really liked it, and I thought it was it was um, you know action packed. It was concise. It was it was really good. It moves along really nicely. For sure. And Josh, what's your impression? Yeah, this was a really fun one. Again, Amazing Spider Man has been pretty steady with having some mm-hmm. consistent uh, consistently good issues. Um, mm-hmm. Pretty much all in all, this was a pretty solid story. I think that there's like one small thing uh, that mm-hmm. kind of bothered me. And it's it's really kind of like nitpicking at this point. But um, it, it was weird to me that, Sp- that Peter came to the conclusion that because this guy was so hard to defeat, the only way to defeat him is to drop something heavy on him. And, and, <laughs> and that's not like, it's not a bad thing that, that the bad guy was defeated this way. It's a bad thing that that Spider-Man actually had a thought bubble that said, "I think the only way I'm going to stop this thing is to drop something big on him." Yeah. Like it was just like so weird and like I felt kind of out of place. Like why why would that be the first thing you would think of if if it's like a tough guy that you tough robot that you can't beat? Like it, it could have been interesting maybe if like. I, like the the robot earlier on maybe like knocked into something and like after like like a, like a building or you know a water tower fell on him and it stopped him for a little bit sure. or like it dinged his sure. armor it's like oh it, he needs like some you know some like a lot of pressure to actually crush him and it would make sense that he would you know jump to that conclusion it just i don't know it seemed a little mm-hmm. weird but other than that that i thought it was um pretty solid uh yeah i, I kind of like this whole Lance Bannon, Amy Powell kind of relationship and how he, Peter has to like help this guy that's kind of been his enemy and his bully for a little while. Mm-hmm. Like he's, I love right. that his personal life, he's always thrown back into being like the one being bullied and still having to help them and save them. Even, even outside of his uh, superhero costume, he's got to be the one to save the day. Uh, that mm-hmm. really kind of, uh, is what makes Peter Parker Spider Man is that kind of like superhero and normal life always collapsing on him. Yes. Uh, and yep. and I think you said before he was supposed to go out on a date with Amy, but she he called her to like call things off because he didn't want any of the drama with between the two of them, uh, um, Powell and right. uh, uh, Lance. And she kind of talked way too fast and just created this date, and Peter didn't get a chance to get a word in before she hung up on him. Mm. Uh, so she, so he agreed to the date and said that, Lance, you have to come to this date as well, and I'm going to like finally resolve this issue once and for all, and we'll talk. And then when he went back to his apartment to get ready to go out to meet the two of them, uh, that's when she surprised him at the house. So he didn't even realize she was going to be there. Right, right, So right, I don't right, know. It's right. I think it's fun. Like, it's... It's kind of has some like melodramatic moments and like, you mm-hmm. know, the, the, like the cheesy romance bits. But I, I think it works for Peter, especially since it's not going his way. And it's kind of like mucking up his life and his love life, especially, of course, MJ's got to walk in right as she like forces like a kiss on him. So, right, right. Yeah, right. this was I think this is a pretty fun issue all around. 
Okay, so uh, yeah. why does MJ yeah. have keys to his apartment, though? That's a good question. Is that established I have, already? I, I haven't read many 70s Spider-Man comics, but I believe they might have lived together. And I believe that... I, I seem to remember that he might have proposed to her and she turned him down. And then she proposed again in like 87 and that's when she said yes and they got married. But I could be wrong about that. Right. But the fact that she has a key, it means they must have lived together, I assume, right? Or I feel like if you let yourself into somebody's apartment and they it's a locked yeah. door and they happen to be kissing another person, yeah. like you don't really have a lot of say in this matter. Yeah, she doesn't look mm-hmm. upset. Or no, she doesn't. Which is fine. She's sort of like, oh, hi, honey. Hmm. <laughs> right. Because they, yeah, they haven't been a thing for quite some time. So it's not weird that he's seeing somebody else at this point like from her perspective right. um maybe she got them from the landlord i don't know i don't i don't know i, I kind of doubt that doubt that yeah, yeah I, i'm gonna assume they live together but i don't know for sure but i guess we'll find out next issue yeah. right yeah but, um, yeah i just i also want to touch on the art one more time so one of the things about comic book art is ideally you're supposed to be able to roughly tell what the story is without even reading the bubbles and the thought bubbles and the description. So I just, uh, everyone, I would like you to jump back to page two, digital sure. page two, actually, th- well, three, which is page two of the story. But I love this page where he, Peter's walking through the hallway and then he sees the bulletin board, right? And we just see the look on his face and then the, the professor come up behind him. I love that final panel where it's a white background, but we still see the desk and then the bulletin board on the wall. I thought that was really mm. cool. Did you guys notice that at all? Because usually it's either one or the other. Either yeah. it's a fully detailed background or it's um, an empty background. But in this case, he's kind of mixed it too. So it's kind of cool. I don't know. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, because it, it, I don't know if you, again, that's like just giving you the amount of information that you need to understand what's happening. Like you still right. understand and where I'll, they are in, in the space because we've established that Peter is standing in front of this corkboard and... You don't need to right. see Peter Parker actually physically take a step and turn around. We just know he's turned around because the corkboard is now behind him. Like, it, you don't need to see every right. single step of the action. You you get the entire story just within these six panels. And the other thing, too, is especially in contrast to Marvel Team Up, yeah. um, I, I've always, I always say that the, the ratio of, like, art to words is perfect in Amazing Spider-Man because... When you're reading it, you kind of zip through it. It flows nicely. It's almost like it's pulling you in. And I feel like Marvel Team Up, it's it's pushing you out because there's way too much writing. The art is good, but not as good. Did you notice that difference, Kristen? Oh, my God. It was huge. Oh, my God. To go into, if this is where we're transitioning, I have so many things to say. I mean, this, that, there's a lot more words in Marvel Team Up. That's that's what I'll say right now. There's it, you can see like it's yeah. it's like half the real estate is devoted to these long passages. Right. Yeah. And, re- and, and before we get yeah, but, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I was just gonna say you you really have moments to breathe in Amazing Spider-Man. It feels like that you're you're right. not constantly like stopping to read what's going on. The the right. images just work for themselves and you can just kind of like take a moment to take in the art where before where we're like with Marvel team up, there's so much, there's so many like word bubbles, so much dialogue that I have to go through. I, I find myself Mm -hmm. glancing at the images and then moving on to the next panel because I'm just trying to finish the comic. Right, 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 right. So you know what? Yeah, that makes a good transition point. Uh, I'm going to quickly say I do recommend this. This is another great chapter in Roger Stern's classic Spider-Man run. Uh, Kristen, do you recommend this issue? Absolutely, yes. This I I want to know what comes right before this and right after. And I want to say, again, not as a comic book reader regularly, the fact that like all of these other events are referenced and that it's like, asterisk, you can find this in blah, blah, blah. You can find this in blah, blah, blah. I'm like, great. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what issue I need to go find so that I know what happened that time with Black Cat or whatever. Right. right. And then, yeah, they knew what they were doing because even as a kid, I'm like, well, now i got to read that. Right. Yeah. Know, Defenders number 51 or whatever it is. Yeah, you're right. So does that make uh, you Josh, interested you in going see- back to like see what what's happened in the previous ones? Yeah, I I mean, there's so many things in this in this story. Like to look at as at at it as a standalone, um, there's so many references to other things that happened. Like I would want to know. I mean, the MJ story. Like I don't know where how far back I would have to go to find her. But like the the other references that he makes. I'm trying to look for one here in the where we are. But um, 
like the thinker references mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. something that happened you know in a past episode and right and uh the black cat episode like i would absolutely want to go back and see what those things are um to kind of inform this story before going forward because and partially because it's such an enjoyable read i, I mean i would want to see more stories like this for sure right Right. So it, does it does it take anything away then that you don't always get like every single detail or like can you just enjoy this story or do you feel like you're missing something when you're kind of thrown in the middle? No, I think this is great. Okay, I, I think this is enough. It gives you enough information. But I guess we're we're looking at at um, you know an issue that introduces um a villain so you so you get a little bit of that backstory or at least i don't maybe i don't know if it feels like they're introducing this villain for the first time so we're getting um enough backstory on this villain to establish who he is and what he's going after in this issue um so you i think those aspects of the story as long as those are clear um yeah it's it's really enjoyable and i think it works as a standalone piece you know who everybody is you know what they want and they go on a journey throughout the issue i think those are important elements and i think that's one of the lost um you know aspects of modern comics is that they they really only function as a slice or a chapter of a greater story whereas this functions both ways right right it's part of a longer story but it also works on its own yeah that's that's why i asked just because um it's important that the story works by itself, but though those, because for me, those like snippets where it's like re- referencing to other characters and other events, those should kind of just be like, like extra things added to the story and not what the story is about. And you should be able to, right. you know, uh, enjoy it by itself for what it is and just kind of, uh, th- those little moments are there so you know that Spider Man is part of this bigger world and is in this like place with all these other characters and st- who have their own stories and um, you can kind of go and figure that out for yourself if you'd like, or if you don't, you can just read the story and be happy with it and enjoy it just the same. So yeah, that's yeah, definitely I think, what I, I asked. I think too. the additional information, yeah, the, the additional information clarifies um, like for in the instance of the thinker, for example, I mean, mm-hmm. he, he says, Oh, I remember last time the Spider-Man beat this guy. And, and so we need that information for this, uh, battle this this meetup because we need to know you know what he's how he's building on it or what informs his choices in this story um, but you don't need to go back and read the whole story but it does it piques your interest um, mm-hmm. to, to go back and learn it I think it's it's a great balance I think they struck a perfect balance with this one for sure mm-hmm. yeah it, I agree uh, so obviously Josh I assume you recommend it yes I do yes <laughs> all right and on that note we're gonna jump to Marvel team up 131 and Josh, do your best. Okay. Try to summarize this story. Okay. So uh, this uh, this issue, we have Spider-Man teaming up with Frogman, who we have seen in Marvel team up uh, a few issues ago, well, more than a few, a little while back. Mm-hmm. Um, but we start off mm-hmm. in this uh, this diner where the White Rabbit is uh, and her goons are holding up the place, and, and uh, we see. Um, Gene, I believe his name is, uh, he runs into the washroom and he changes into his alter ego, which is the Frogman. Uh, it's his, uh, right. his dad's uh, former alias uh, when he was like a criminal mastermind. And now he, his son has kind of taken that costume and he's trying to be a hero and, and reclaim that name of the Frogman to be this uh, hero that can kind of fight with the Avengers and Spider-Man and, and hold his own. Uh, so yeah, the, he, he tries to stop them. He's not too successful. He's about to get shot and Spider-Man comes in and swoops him and saves the day. And he kind of comes in and claims like, come on, I could, I, you know, I had, I had it covered and Spidey's kind of trying to teach him that he's <laughs> yeah. maybe a little in over his head. Uh, and then, uh, we see Peter, uh, reconnect with, um, his old friend, Roger, and uh, mm-hmm. his his friend calls him over because he's having some trouble. So Peter goes over and uh, Roger uh, says that he's kind of running out of money. Uh, he's dealing with his mother's medical bills that he can't afford. So Spider-Man decides that he's going to try to catch the White Rabbit because there's a bounty on her head. So he'd be able to use that money to mm-hmm. give to his friend Roger to pay for his um, uh, mother's hospital bills. 
Uh, so after that, we see Spider-Man and Frogman kind of run into each other again. And as they're talking on the rooftop, uh, White Rabbit drives by in the van and they jump down to try and stop her. And uh, in the meantime, uh, his Frogman, Gene's dad, um, uh, he's working with the right White Rabbit at this point. So he's kind of gone back into crime to raise money for the family. And uh, it all kind of comes to a head when there's this final confrontation and, uh, the, the, you know, the she, Spider-Man, Frogman, they're kind of fighting with White Rabbit and the goons. She gets thrown through a building and it just so happens mm-hmm. to be uh, the hospital room with Roger and his mother. Right. And, right. And he convenient, hits, convenient. Yeah, uh, he hits her over the head with a bottle and knocks her out. So he kind of gets the reward, but Frogman and Spider Man also get a bit of the reward because they tried to help stop, uh, stop her. And then it also turns out that uh, Jean's dad was actually working with the police and was wearing a wire uh, to try to stop the White Rabbit as well. So he also got a chunk of the reward at the end so it kind of has this nice little epilogue where roger and peter are talking about how they finally uh, were able to pay for the medical bills and still have lots of money left over to buy everybody presents (laughs) that's about it yeah i honestly i i didn't hate this one yeah i I don't know oh my god it's it's kind of like a backhanded (laughs) compliment for marvel team up but (laughs) Oh, oh no! Yeah, we we read like forty three issues of this, and this is one of the better ones. Oh my god! I didn't hate yeah. it. I think like I actually really the art was better than average, and I think any problems that have could have been solved if you took the amount of words in this comic and cut them in half, it would have helped so much. For sure. But other than that, I did not hate this comic. So, yeah. Kristen, what is your impression of Marvel uh, Team Up number one thirty one? Okay, so. I did not think that it had that many redeeming qualities. <laughs> I, found, <laughs> okay, okay. I found it really hard to read. I mean, I know it's been said it's got a lot of text. Um, there's there's just a lot to slog through. Like, the whole thing. I'm not sure. I, it appears that the White Rabbit's shtick is vocabulary. I'm not sure. Like, there's there's a couple of... Or or not. Like, maybe that's just the writing. <laughs> it just seemed like she's she's using, like, 11 words to say what she could say with one. Um, yeah. And that, I found, really bogged the story down to begin with. Like, it prevented her from being, like, a really cool, quippy villain. Mm-hmm. Uh, because mm-hmm. she's, like, one of the more theatrical villains I think I've seen. And, uh, and then Frogman just, like, won't stop talking. And there's, like, all of mm-hmm. this... This uh, Frogman and his dad stuff, and and I just I found it really like um, overly emotional, like all of the like Roger's mom and the hospital bills, and Eugene's <laughs> Eugene's dad is gonna go back into a life of crime, and like he's the, I mean I imagine for somebody who's been living like the the Marvel team up life for a long time, actually I think they referenced. I think it's a Daredevil comic or something where uh, the original Frogman was a bad guy that was fighting Mm -hmm. Daredevil back in the day. Right, right. Um, And they, you know, they take us back with this, this now Frogman has a kid and and he wants to be a super. And it's just sort of like Mm -hmm. the whole, the whole thing was just, Mm -hmm. by the time we got back into White Rabbit's lair and she's like, just monologuing like there's just so much text to try and burn through i i started to really shut off from the story like it was hard to get back into Mm -hmm. any of the cool fight sequences that happened after Mm -hmm. that point um because it it uh, the pace was so bogged down with it i found yeah right that's exactly how i felt yeah it's like it's making it like homework to try and trudge through all this dialogue and description. But it's not just but, the the ratio. Like it's, I think to me, it's two issues. It's like the the ratio of text to images, but it's also the content of the text is right. so is so melodramatic. Right, right. Like it's so it drags you down that it's like it's yeah. not worth. It's emotionally, I'm not even into this story anymore. Yeah, yeah, because obviously something like um, I don't know if you've ever read Watchmen, but obviously Alan Moore. He his writing is very text heavy, but the difference is that it's really good. So you want right. to read it. 
Right. Whereas this is not great. And so, yeah, it just makes it a chore to get through. Yeah, I don't mind reading dialogue um, if there's substance. Right. Right, right, right. It's just it feels like, like you were saying before, it, it, there's too many words when they could be saying it in a lot less or none at all. Mm -hmm. Because the art is right. supposed to be telling the story. Right. Right. So. Um, and all. And, and all. Yep. Yeah. And and also, there's a flashback. Like the Kristen, the, you mentioned the flashback to Daredevil. Again, though, when I saw those flashbacks, I looked at the amount of text, and I'm like, I don't need to read this. Skip. Whereas the, the flashbacks in Amazing Spider-Man, they made me want to go and read those issues. These yes. flashbacks made me glad I didn't read them. You know. Right. Right. I just like I just oh I don't care. That's true. Right. You know? Just I, get back to the story. I did also find myself skipping over parts that I just felt like I yep. knew were not going to be important. And maybe that's why I enjoyed yep. it so much more than I normally <laughs> yeah. do. Um, it, that's probably why you also didn't have as much fun reading this is because you probably read it all. And I, I, found, I found myself just kind of like, okay, yeah, I understand what's going on. And just like move on to the next little bit because I, it's just been so so many weeks of like reading incoherent trash and at wow. least yeah, with this yeah, one yeah. At, with this one there's a story at least spider-man there's a reason for spider-man to be here there's a reason for him to be teaming up with this character there's an actual story going on it is just kind yes. of buried in like mumbled up words and giant dialogue bubbles so i will say i think by the time the three storylines came together I, I really liked mm. the ending, but there's like that that was the redeeming quality was like the the adorable coincidence at the end where everybody is I no I caught her no I caught her actually I was working for the cops the whole time like it, right. it just <laughs> I maybe I I don't know I guess I'm turning out to be kind of like a, a hokey kind of comic reader but I'm like oh I love that all the all the loose ends are all tied up at the end right. and everybody gets to go home happy and he saves his mom and and the son and the dad get to have a moment you're my hero like it's so <laughs> it's great it was great oh geez dad you're the greatest yeah <laughs> and you know what? Yeah, like it's <laughs> that, that's. I think that's some of the charm of these comics. I, I think that sure. the sometimes like some of those more hokey moments work, and if if that's what the story mm -hmm. needs, right? And I think that that is what this story is trying to be. It's it's this more like light and campy, fun adventure that's going on where it's this you're following this kid who's trying to be a superhero, and you have this like you know coincidence that the dad used to be. a you know, uh, in the mob or, you know, do crime. And now he's working with the police and Spider-Man's trying to stop this kid. But Spider-Man was also his age swinging around New York fighting crime. So it's like, I don't know, there, there's, there's some fun aspects to it. And I think that these characters really work together and there's a good reason for them all to be together. I just think that the execution just needed to be streamlined and Refined. trimmed a little bit. Right. Yeah, because usually in Marvel Team Up, what we find with the writer J.M. Demetrius is that he throws a bunch of crap at the wall to see what sticks. Mm. At least in this story, everything does fit together. And I think that's why it works so right. much better than previous issues. But yeah, it definitely needed some editing. Um, I also found the art a little bit better than average. Um, Kristen, what did you think of the art in this issue? I thought it was kind of cool. I, I like mm. um, you know the way that the White Rabbit is drawn. I thought she was a really cool character i don't i don't know it's it's difficult to say because i think that the art could have been better if it wasn't cluttered up with so many speech bubbles sure. um but and i think some of the like the fight scene between frogman and and white rabbit i thought was a little bit convoluted like a lot of the you can see that there's a lot of movement there's a lot of action but what was told it you know comparing it to the amazing spider-man what was told in those stories with uh, clever angles or, or being able to see, um, you know, the directions that the characters are moving in. This is just being told with a lot of action lines. So you're seeing like, then, you know, this, this must be a really busy fight because they've been all over the place because of her rocket boots and, you know, all those things. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I felt like some of it was really convoluted that way. Um, but, uh, but I like some of the, you know, the, the look of, of some of the characters anyway, I thought was well drawn. For sure. Um, uh, Josh, did you notice the difference at all, or was it pretty much the same? Uh, you know, I, I didn't really notice a whole lot of a difference. There wasn't a whole lot that stuck out as really bad to me. 
Sure. But it could also have been because I was just kind of <laughs> skimming through. Skimming. And like, <laughs> yeah, I will say I really do love Frogman. I love, I love the mm-hmm. look of this costume. I love this frumpy Muppet face that it's that this mm-hmm. character has. I love that it's right. it kind of looks like uh, like scuba flippers that this character is yep. wearing, and like you could you can mm-hmm. see exactly how this costume was made, and the fact that it's like this kid's like hand me down costume that he's using. And he's mm-hmm. like a wannabe superhero. I absolutely love that. I love the premise of that. I love the idea. I really like this character, Gene. And I love, like, the entire premise behind Frogman. I think it's so fun. And that's the thing. Yeah, I, I think Spider-Man, the series, definitely lends itself to having co- pure comedy issues like this. Where mm-hmm. the villain's ridiculous, the hero's ridiculous, but it still can have a good story, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna say I actually, tr- it, tr- with trepidation, I recommend this issue. I actually think yeah. it's one of the better Marvel team ups I've read. Yeah. You agree, Josh? Yeah, I think I would recommend this issue because of Frogman, because of the story between him and his dad, <laughs> and yeah. just just kind of like showing this character. I I, I feel like I wanted some more, um, maybe like heart to heart moments with Frogman and Spider Man, where he's kind of like. Mm-hmm. maybe maybe less of like scolding him like come on kid you can't do this and more of like okay you're gonna do this whether i ask you to or not so i might as well show you how to do it correctly or how to do it safely and like you know working together to kind of train this new hero i think that that would be such a fun uh character and story that i'd love to see so i hope i really hope we get more of this character <laughs> I, well, I've re- I read ahead and I can see he comes back, but go ahead. Nice. Oh my God. I, I do. I love the comedy of, uh, you know, and this happens in so many different stories where you have like the new, the new superhero kid. That's like, I'm going to be a superhero too. I got right. special <laughs> boots. And then they show up and like destroy everything. I, I think yeah. that's hilarious. I love that. Yeah. So yeah, I, I could go for, for more Frogman if he doesn't talk so much. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so two in a row. We're doing okay here. So now we're going to jump to Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man number 80. And uh, if you could, uh, Kristen, feel free. Uh, yeah, summarize this one for us. Tell us what happens. Okay, so I'm going to give us just kind of like a, a quick, quick overview. This entire sure. episode, this uh, entire issue is from the from the perspective of J. Jonah Jameson, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, you know, it opens up with him typing on his typewriter and he's telling this story about uh, his job and what he had to do in this story. I didn't start this story. I inherited it. And it takes him uh, into this this world where he's going to be the reporter and he's going to expose, uh, you know, this crime that's taking place. Uh, but what he doesn't know is that Spider-Man is going to follow along. So it starts out with... with uh, uh, Peter Parker is going to ask him a question. He's like, I got no time for you. And then he, he goes, well, where are you off to? So he, so Peter Parker turns into Spider-Man and starts following him. Um, and then J. J. Jonah Jameson goes and visits Kingpin to get some more information about this crime that's going on down at the waterfront. And he goes down into this warehouse um, and the bad guys find him. And then he's got to, <clears throat> excuse me, he's got to have this... <laughs> This battle, what he doesn't know is that Spider-Man is behind him the whole time, uh, getting all the bad guys out of the way for him. And as it turns out, uh, at the very end, he finds out that Spider-Man was there all along and uh, and put all the pieces together for him. And it closes with him finishing his story on the typewriter. So what I thought was interesting about this one was that the, there is kind of two things going on where where you can see that he's writing this story on his typewriter. Mm-hmm. So in addition to the live speech bubbles that are going on in the scene, we also have his commentary about it after the fact happening, right. you know, right in line with it. And, and, you know, the commentary on what his job is as a journalist and how it's changed from when he was younger to what he is now and, and how, you know, wealth and fame has changed him and all this stuff. Um, and, and as he finishes, like he's always down on Spider-Man. That means I should tell mm-hmm. Spider-Man's part in this story, but mm-hmm. then there are elements that get lost on the way to the printer and the, and that final page gets torn off and, and flies away in the wind. Thanks to Spider-Man. So I, you know, I, uh, I, I really liked it. I thought it was, it was an interesting perspective, but I would say, 
as far as, you know, the three that we're reviewing tonight, it wasn't my favorite because, it, you know, it was probably my least favorite because of the way that it was laid out. It was an interesting perspective, but it wasn't as as action packed, I thought, as like, a, you know, I'm I'm here for the Spider-Man. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I think that Amazing Spider-Man was probably the most entertaining, but I think this one is the most... I guess experimental and it's kind of like I admire it the most because right. again, it probably because Josh and I have just read 10 issues in a row uh, of spectacular Spider-Man that have dealt with this tedious storyline that just kept going on and on and on. So this is the first issue that hasn't dealt with that. So that's one positive. The other positive is that it's a standalone, right? Like this could really take place yeah. at any point in Spider-Man's history, so that's the thing. But also the fact that it's narrated narrated by uh, J. Jonah Jameson and not Peter Parker is very unique. I don't think I've ever seen that in a Spider-Man comic. Uh, you know, the kind of unreliable narrator where we're reading what he's saying, but then we're seeing what's actually happening with Spider-Man. I thought that was great. And on top of that, this art is again, it's um, it's Ron friends who goes on to become the regular artist for spider-man in a few years but this is him imitating spider-man's co-creator steve ditko and i think he does an incredible job and um so yeah like this is honestly this could be the best issue that bill mantle has done i think uh josh what do you think i think this is my favorite issue of the week i yeah. i absolutely loved it um again it could be because uh for the past 40 plus weeks We've been reading Spider-Man comics, and it's kind of been the same like feel and flavor, even though there's different villains and different stories. We're all kind of uh, watching it through the lens of Peter Parker. So having a little bit of a break in something so like new and fresh, I, I had right. so much fun reading this. Um, I don't think there were any moments where I felt like the story was going slow or that there was too much dialogue or like there were there were no moments where the the story just stopped to kind of kind of like have these like weird side moments that don't really connect like everything was so mm -hmm. streamlined and smooth and like felt like every little thing had a reason to be there uh, i love these right. moments where uh, we get to see j jonah jameson's uh James, jameson's soft side we also kind of get to seeing him be like this tough guy like him going up against the kingpin is so right. amazing like that is right. crazy we we've seen mm -hmm. in in the past few issues of spectacular we've seen uh doc ock go up against him and lose we've seen boomerang go up against him lose uh black cat i think black cat i think mm -hmm. does win but like it, it's because it's like this physical fight she kind of like doesn't really actually interact with him like it's it's so great to see the two of them go head to head and they're kind of like right. on the same like even playing field and mm -hmm. they both end up kind of coming out of this on top where you think that JJ is just going to kind of be destroyed. Like when right. it, th that that first panel where he where you see him open the door and then it's his POV and you see Kingpin standing behind the pool table. Mm -hmm. And J. Jonah Jameson is talking about how, like, yeah, there's goons there, but they just watch him play. Like, I don't know. There's just so much about mm -hmm. it. It feels like a noir detective story. Right, I, absolutely. I, yeah. I so enjoyed this one. Oh, man, I feel like I, I'm so off the mark right now. I, I want to <laughs> say I, I think that if this had been – if I had read this after reading mm. a whole lot of Spider-Man comics, this would be a welcome change. And it's such mm -hmm. it's such a change of pace and it's it's a, such a well-crafted story to stand alone as its own thing. Like, this is a J. Jonah Jameson right. comic. Um, and it takes you back. Like, I, I love that, that it takes you – back to the old days for him because for him it is a film noir for him it is those you know the old detective stories i feel like it, it takes you right back to that um but for for a new reader to start here it doesn't it doesn't make sense because you don't i mean kingpin i kind of vaguely know is like one of the big villains but there's nothing about this story that tells me who kingpin is except for the look of it but that being said mm -hmm. that's kind of a strength like i don't I don't need to know all of the Kingpin history to know that the sky turns black like 
every panel with Kingpin in it has a black background. It's like the darkest sure. part. Mm-hmm. You know, he he's wading into the the den of evil here, and uh, and I think some of that was really. It communicated well, for sure, even if it didn't end up being my favorite story. Like, there there were some really beautiful elements there. That's the thing, uh, especially with this era of Marvel Comics is, like, for example, in this issue, there might not be one panel that you can single out as being great, although there are some, but it's more like just the overall feel when you go through it. It's like you said, Kristen, it's like, well... You know, this this entire sequence is in shadow and the way that he's drawn and the way he's standing, I know that he's important. I know that he's scary. And then, you know, J. Jonah Jameson going through the street and the, the streaks of clouds and fog in the sky, like every panel, it's just telling a story. And when you when you when you just glance at these pages, you can just see that it seems like every panel was planned out perfectly. Like I'm gonna have these four words and this is what the image is and it feels like it fits together perfectly like a puzzle you know Mm -hmm. and that's what i think makes it work and yeah i think this is one of the best issues of spectacular yeah it could be one of it could be the best i think it's great yeah um yeah and also i I want want to point out that um steve ditko as you know like i said was spider-man's co-creator and the stuff that he did in the first 38 issues of spider-man was much more like this than when john romita senior took over uh, it was much more bright and fun and action packed and you know whatever and that's and so then coincidentally his son is kind of more like that and that's it's interesting because for for a couple years now amazing has been the bright action packed fun one and spectacular has been like the dark film noir one and so I think it really works unfortunately Marvel team up doesn't really have an identity it's kind of <laughs> there to fill, fill you know the space it's like a commercial for all the all of their other comics. Oh right, my gosh! Right, right. Mm-hmm. This is like the problem that I have with half of the Avengers movies. Is that they're just commercials for other movies, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, there. This is like the the convoluted storylines that bring together way too many people, and and they have a really hard time finding their way through an entertaining story because they're trying to address so many different characters' motivations that right. uh, you can you never really get a full story from any of them, and it's hard to mm-hmm. figure out. Who are you rooting for? You know, who do you really cheer for when we have success? Is there, uh, you know, inner strife between them? Like in a lot of ways, the Marvel team up that we read tonight is the same as uh, my all of my problems with Avengers or whatever, whatever that's called, Civil War. Mm-hmm. Um, right, right. Okay. Captain America: yep. Civil War. Um, which I always think that that movie is like an Avengers movie because there's so many different people in it. And, and, you know, in the same way that the team up that we read tonight was the same sort of thing. Like you've got Roger's problems and Peter's problems and, uh, Mm -hmm. and Frogman's problems and dad's problems. Like there's, there's just too much. There's just too much where, um, I feel like the J Jonah Jameson story, uh, streamlines it to the point where you know it, it doesn't even matter who the bad guy is in this story. There's no stakes for the villain. There's no there's no like I'm gonna beat the bad guy. It's a story about uh, who J. Jonah Jameson is and what he discovers about himself in this altercation. Mm-hmm. It could have been anything, and mm-hmm. and Spider Man could have saved him from anything. That you know that it was about how how he sees himself and how the Spider-Man will save him even though he hates him, you know? Right. It's just amazing because again, it, I think it's like, even though I can't argue with the financial success of the Marvel movies, they, they, they do get the comics right to an extent, but they're missing the mark a little bit and that they seem to think that, all of the crossovers and setups are what make Marvel Comics great. And but and they're kind of right. But this one does it better where, for example, like at this point, the Kingpin is mainly a Daredevil villain, right? Mm-hmm. But but let's just say in this story, I don't think Ben Urich makes an appearance. But even let's just say he did. Ben Urich is a Daredevil character. But if he were to show up in this, we don't need an explanation. We don't need a little. Right. I think he is asterisk. named in this one. Yeah, he, yeah, I think he is, yeah. And it's like it's just cool because if you're a Daredevil reader, you might read this and go, oh, look, it's Ben Urich mm-hmm. from Daredevil. Or it's Kingpin. Or maybe there's another character where you go, oh, look, it's this guy right. from that. But you don't make it feel like you have to read something else to get what's going and, on. And I, and I think, I think they, they do that really well right. with their single their single one-off movies. 
I think that you do get those moments where you're like, oh, that character's mm-hmm. from this one, or oh, like right. that's like you know that's like a hint to right. this, or you know you do get those moments. Mm-hmm. But then when you have those like some of the larger ones, like Age of Ultron, really sticks out to me as one of the ones where it feels like a connective movie that's just there to go to the next step. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It doesn't work. Right, because like Age of Ultron is really like Thor goes off and goes on his own mission where he's and swimming in the pool and right. having visions yeah. about what's going to happen in you know the next Avengers movie, and then uh, yeah. like you know they're setting up the Vision and he's kind of just thrown in there. I think in Age of Ultron and like mm. I know there's there's just so many things that just happen to kind yeah. of move on to the next step. Where yeah, I I, I do really appreciate that in this one. Um, it is its own issue. Yeah. It, right. You know, yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. I, again, I, going back to uh, the ending, I really enjoyed that too. Cause we have, we have J Jonah Jameson realizing that he is kind of similar to Spider-Man. Like, mm-hmm. like he couldn't have done it. He probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Spider-Man uh, swinging along with him and, and helping him throughout the story mm-hmm. and he even acknowledges that to the point where he writes it in the story that he's about to publish and then when right. Spider-Man comes to swing and takes the story from the typewriter to see what's going on Spider-Man acknowledges that J. Jonah Jameson uh, you know kind of realizes that and and he, Peter decides to throw away the bit about Spider-Man coming and saving the day to give J. Jonah Jameson mm-hmm. his time to kind of be the hero again and I think it's yeah. fantastic because right, right. it's it's like it's it's their relationship on like two levels, where with J. Jonah Jameson and Peter, and with him and Spider Man, because he mm-hmm. there's a lot of moments where J. Jonah Jameson is very brash and kind of rude and arrogant towards Peter, but there are also times where he kind of treats Peter as his son and like takes him under his wing, mm-hmm. and he genuinely does care about him, even though he's kind of a jerk and you know brushes him off a lot of the time at the end of the day he does care about him and then it's nice to see spider-man and peter kind of acknowledge that and and allow jjj to have that moment in the sun and like i don't know i I just i think that it ties to like it ties everything up so well we only get a like a, a couple of panels at the beginning with peter parker um right. where he runs into J. Jonah Jameson and then he, we see him running out of the building of the Daily Bugle and he puts on the Spider-Man costume and then we only get like little flashes of Spider-Man throat. I don't think he says right, anything right. else the rest of the comic. Um Right. Maybe That's a great maybe point. when he yeah. maybe when he interrupts the No, no, not even when he uh when even when he goes and interrupts the goons and starts fighting them you just see the flash of the spider signal and then the goons say right. not him and then it cuts back to J. Jonah Jameson's story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great so point. So even when he's like sitting on the uh, the building reading it, we see the web come in, take the page, and he's sitting on the side of the building and then swings away. There's no dialogue. There's no thought bubbles. There's not even any like descriptions going on. We see him reading it and then swing off and the page is falling to the ground. It's... So good. And you know what? I actually have to uh, make one important uh, observation, and that's that, especially talking with that last scene, the the text, if you were to read the script on its own, it would not have the same meaning. If you were to just look at the pictures, it would not have the same meaning, right? You have right. to look at them together. So that, to me, this is like the definition of a great comic for that very reason. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I definitely recommend this issue. Josh? Yeah, I definitely do. And, and uh, Kristen, I completely understand why you wouldn't enjoy this at first, too, because it is it is very different and not what you would expect from a comic, especially <laughs> especially coming to, like, a Spider-Man podcast and, like, oh, yeah, we're going to give you these three Spider-Man comics to read. And you get this one, like, J. Jonah Jameson, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? it, it's, it's it was, uh, yeah. definitely different from what you you would expect. Yeah, it was, for sure. I mean, I would say I recommend it, but not for a new reader. I think right. I would say that. 
Like you have sure. to you have to at least know. I feel like the the one thing that you have to know going into this is the power dynamic between J. Jonah Jameson and, and Peter Parker mm-hmm. and and alternately J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man. Like you have to know what those two relationships are because it plays so much with that power dynamic like setting up that uh, JJ is in charge at the paper and and uh, the way that he brushes off Peter and, and the fact that he's absolutely the power in that relationship. But then to give Spider-Man all the power at the end, um, you know, I feel like there's, there's that beautiful uh, juxtaposition of the two characters and their completely opposite relationships with... Uh, with J. Jonah Jameson. So I feel like you, you need to know a little bit about that. Like that has to be established in, on some level um, mm-hmm. in order for you to really enjoy the play that's going on here. Mm-hmm. True. Yep, definitely. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's like Josh said, it's always good to know because sometimes, you know, we take a lot of this for granted, but I think Beck has also pointed out the same thing that jumping into even Amazing Spider-Man into the middle of a story, sometimes it's a little bit jarring. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, I guess my question is overall, are you excited to read more Spidey comics? <laughs> <laughs> always, always, always excited to read more Spidey. I do. I I have a soft spot for Spider Man for sure. I like I like his stories a lot. So yeah, I would read more. I I am That's becoming great. a comic book fan, Mike. I don't know what you're doing to me, but it's happening. <laughs> awesome. Then we'd love to have you back on again. So I'll definitely be contacting you soon. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so I guess that wraps up this episode. So, Josh, you can take it from here. Yeah, uh, we want to thank you guys uh, for listening to the podcast. Uh, if you like us, uh, it really helps when you leave a review over on Apple Podcast, or if you drop us a comment or tweet, uh, you can reach us over at, at HCT Spidercast or at Comic Syndicate on Twitter, or you can find us at the Comic Book Syndicate pretty much anywhere else. Uh, we want to keep that conversation going. So, yeah, please keep in touch. All right, and once again, we want to thank Kristen for joining us. It was a great episode. We're definitely going to have you back again. And mm-hmm. until next Monday, this has been Here Comes the Spider Cast. All right, see you then. Ah!